Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Pat Huddleston. I'm the director of the Information and Media PhD program, and I'm glad to see such a great turnout for Cliff Lampy's presentation. Um, Johannes Bauer will introduce Cliff in a couple minutes, but I just want to say that uh, we've made some modifications to the PhD program this year, and so Cliff is our inaugural speaker for the professionalism requirement for the new students coming in. And, uh -oh. and um, I, yeah, <laughs> da, 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 da. yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're really pleased to have him with us today. Also, um, the luncheon will be down the hall in room 191 immediately following Cliff's presentation. So hopefully those of you that can join us can join us down there. And uh, I know that we have some undergraduate SONA students, and if you haven't already signed in, there's a place um, just outside the door on my right, your left, um, so you may want to do that uh, if you haven't already done so. So Johann I'm going to turn over to Johannes, and he can... Tell us wonderful things about yeah, let, let me can, come over here too, in case they, they want to pick up. <laughs> yes. So I'm, I'll, I'll keep it short because I'd like uh, Cliff to share his research. And it's a great pleasure to welcome here, uh, him here at, at MSU. Welcome him back. He, he spent some time here. Cliff has always impressed me because of his uh, innovative research. I mean, he, he has done pioneering work on social media use. If you go to Google Scholars, you see more than 28,000 citations as of this morning, right? And, and the leading one is the one on, on Facebook that he actually did while he was at MSU. Here. That's right. Uh, and uh, so, so kind of a yardstick for you to, uh, to follow. But he also has done um, uh, really groundbreaking work on, on, on civic uh, uh, infrastructure, civic technology, uh, social computing, has over the years taken on leadership roles in, in professional associations such as in the ACM, SICAI, uh, and uh, and uh, is working actually here in Lansing with uh, with uh, the city of Lansing and other stakeholders here to really uh, put into practice some of the things that he has done uh, in his theoretical research. And so that's I think what I find most impressive, right? The the theoretical vision, the theoretical uh, rigor, but then also the you know, the practical relevance of, of the research and the big heart that he brings to what he does. So Cliff, welcome. Thank you much. When it only took nine years for you guys to invite me back, so <laughs> not, not salty at all, I get it. Like, you know. So thanks for having me back, though. Um, my name is Cliff, just like Johanna said. Uh, if you aren't familiar with SIGCHI, because I know you're coming from a more ICA type world, SIGCHI is the Special Interest Group for Human Computer Interaction, uh, which is part of the Association for Computing Machinery. It's a group that runs a lot of computer science research, but more and more as we move along kind of in scholarship, the intersection between communication and computer science intersects as we basically are using computing tools to communicate and enact our lives, right? And so where my work lives is at that intersection of how people use computing tools and computer-mediated communication to basically live their lives. Um, and that's part of what I want to talk about today. Uh, as Johannes was saying, I do a lot of work in the SIGCHI community. So I am currently serving as the executive vice president for SIGCHI, which means uh, if you have a whole set of strong feelings about anything going on in the HCI world, I'm one of the people you should talk to about that. And I'll be serving as general chair for CHI 2022, uh, which will be taking place in the middle part of the United States in the south, uh, in a city known for jazz and good food. Can't name it yet, but you know, you can draw your own conclusions. Um, so it's it's uh, my honor to serve that community. If you haven't been to Kai, it's a lot. It's about the size of ICA in terms of people, um, but more focused on kind of computing technologies and design. So uh, during this talk, I'm going to be talking about my work and uh, kind of engaged citizenship. I just want to be clear that when I talk about the word citizen, I am taking a stance of a citizen as a member of co a community. I'm not speaking to a specific legal framework around citizenship or anything like that. I'm just talking about somebody who lives in a geographic area and may want to contribute back to that geographic area. Okay. All right, so a question for you guys, and feel free to interrupt me anytime as we move along, if I'm not making sense, or you just want, if you have your own thoughts on something. But what makes a good citizen? How do you know if you're a good citizen or not? Yeah. 
Uh-oh, that's depressing. Come on, somebody. Pay taxes. Pay taxes. That's a good one. That's right. Good citizens pay their taxes. Vote. Good citizens vote. Absolutely. Following rules. Say again? Following rules. Following the rules. That's right. Most importantly, a lot of times, good citizens don't break the rules. They don't break laws, right? All of those are true, but the question becomes is can we think of new ways to engage citizenship and to complicate the idea of citizenship for people and what that means to be a member of a community? So Ethan Zuckerman, formerly of the MIT Media Lab, famously within the past week or two, um, talks about this in terms of thin citizenship and thick citizenship. Right? Thin citizenship he describes as things like voting, jury duty, paying taxes, staying out of trouble. Thick citizenship involves a whole bunch of much more engaged activities, right? which can include providing feedback, working directly with policymakers, engaging with local community groups, volunteering your time, advocating for things that you care about. And for the history of human endeavor, mostly these thick citizens, uh, that's with two Cs, thick citizens have been um, rare in communities. Right? They definitely are the minority of people who get that involved. And often, city workers will roll their eyes when they see these very engaged citizens. But can we use information technology in the same way that we've simplified banking uh, through applications like Robinhood, or simplified sharing money through Venmo, or simplified almost all areas of our life through information and communication technology? Can we also simplify what it means to be an engaged citizen? and for cities to engage their citizenry in new and exciting ways. So that's what civic uh, information design, citizen interaction design is about and civic technology more broadly, which is how can citizens reimagine their citizenship in the context of these new information tools. Right? Everybody's cool so far? Got that makes sense? Great. Civic tech, which has kind of been the term of art that this uh, work has fallen under, involves lots of different things, um, e-government services, community organizing, crowdfunding, uh, government data, open data. Um, citizen tech itself has been working in three major areas. So you can think about citizen-to-citizen -citizen interaction that you're fostering, and that's things like crowd work, right? There's a lot of uh, petitions that you might have signed or seen lately, or way of crowdfunding opportunities to help support somebody in a local community. All of these are ways, any good GoFundMe for somebody's kid who's suffering cancer in your area, that is citizenship in its of itself, right? We don't tend to think of that as citizenship, but it is. It's supporting other members of your local community. The other uh, vector that we have is citizen to uh, government. In local areas, that's often survey work, wanting to know what citizens think about a construction project or something like that. It's the dreaded design charrette. Is that a new term for everybody, design charrette? How I many have heard that term before? A couple people, right? It's, um, in, our, in my space, we would call that participatory design or co-design. What it is, it's a design activity that especially people trained in urban planning do where they have a design problem, and then they bring in people to work on that design problem in a co-design, uh, co-located type of space. So it could be something like uh, our walking mall in the center of town isn't getting any traffic, so what should we do with that space? And then they bring people in, and they have a nice big design activity. But the problem, like most of these face-to-face -face activities, is um, they're not getting a great participation level in it, and they're not getting a very diverse set of people who participate in these design charrettes. Um, and then we have government feeding back to citizens. And that can be e-government services. So uh, a good example is like licensing. If I need a bicycle license for my bike in town, I don't want to have to go to City Hall. I want to be able to go to the website and download that and be able to print it out or have it mailed or something like that, right? Basically, anything any business or organization would do to basically offer e-services to somebody, government, of course, also wants to do that because it saves them money. It reduces friction with citizens. They have to see citizens less often, which they love. You know, the whole nine yards. All right. So that's what civic tech has been really thinking about, is how can cities use information technology to change how they deliver services and interact with stakeholders, right? What are, if the design charrette isn't working that well, what else can we do? Uh, they hate being surprised at town hall meetings. Nothing's worse for somebody who works for City Hall than to have their project uh, suddenly become a hot topic at a public city hall meeting. 
Uh, they don't want to be surprised. They do want feedback. Honestly, I'm joking about their beliefs about citizens, but they honestly do want to do what's right for people in their city, and often they don't know what that is. It's, it's amazingly, incredibly opaque what people want to have happen within their local city governments or town governments. All right. So that's what Civic Tech is. Uh, Civic Tech has been around for a while. Gavin Newsom, who uh, wrote a book when he was the mayor of San Francisco uh, called Citizenville. Now he's the governor of the state of California, right? Uh, Newsom wrote a book called uh, uh, Citizenville, which was kind of the first one to popularize the idea of bringing technology processes to traditional civic problems. He really was a, a evangelist for this in a lot of ways. And while there had been a lot of kind of work in this space, especially if you go back in time to the community informatics literature, uh, which is an older literature, um, he, because he was a politician and because he's uh, weirdly handsome, I think, they were able to get a lot of attention towards this issue more broadly. And suddenly, it felt like the entire country was like, what should we be doing around civic tech? So what have cities done? Um, there are a whole bunch of applications now that directly serve uh, kind of civic problems. So C-Click Fix is a very common one. This is an application that you could use. It, could, uh, it was started off as a web app. And basically, you would go and say, hey, there's a big pothole uh, in the middle of Grand River. Could somebody come fix that, please, right? Uh, now, the frustrating thing about C-Click Fix was often lots of people would report that giant pothole in Grand River and it would never get fixed, right? Because it turns out there's a gap between reporting a problem and fixing a problem that was often opaque and uh, unknowable. So uh, cities still use features like C-Click Fix, but they're trying to make it more interesting in a lot of ways. Chicago has done a lot in civic technology. Uh, this is their Chi, or ch I don't know how they pronounce it, it's Chai, it would be Chai, 311, uh, which is basically an information service. You can go to their online service and, and just get tons of information. For instance, uh, how many of you guys have a dog? You have a dog? Do you know exactly how to go get a new license for your dog? About half of you are nodding and half are like, yeah, maybe, right? And I can figure it out. That, that kind of question is really common in a city government. How do I get a fishing license for this year, which is actually a state thing? Uh, how do I make sure my dog is licensed? What do, what do I need from the city in terms of a building permit if I want to add a shed to my backyard? Those kinds of things. So a system like this allows you to uh, figure that out and to also make service requests. City of Grand Rapids has a ton of these things. Uh, Grand Rapids has been investing heavily in civic technology. This is their Adopt a Hydrant uh, platform. So as most of you know, uh, the hydrants are very important, uh, especially if there's a fire happening. And in the winter, the hydrants become a big problem, right? Because the plows suddenly put all the snow on top of the hydrant, and your poor little very important hydrant gets buried in the mound of Michigan snow and ice that we get. So what do you do about that? Well, what Grand Rapids has done is you can adopt a hydrant in your neighborhood and keep it clear of snow throughout the winter months. Like you be, are basically committing to keeping that hydrant clear, right? That's a type of citizenship that's very different than voting or going to do, uh, do jury or paying your taxes, right? All right, so how do these things get made? Uh, what do cities do to make their new civic technology solutions? You know, a lot of them will actually uh, build it in-house, but that's a scale issue, right? To build applications within your own kind of city, you need programmers, you need project managers, you need a ton of staff suddenly to be able to build and maintain applications that you might want to build. So a city the size of Chicago can do that. A city the size of East Lansing or Lansing cannot. Right? They typically don't have the resources to be able to hire a full-time software production staff, especially since at some public meeting, somebody is going to say, why don't you hire another police officer instead of hiring a front-end app developer? Right? Like, you know, uh, my house got robbed. Where was your front-end app developer protecting my house? Right? <laughs> that, that doesn't sell very well in the newspapers, let me tell you. But there's lots of uh, rich options now available to people. So there's a ton of... Um, Consulting shops uh, that will do this work for you. These are just a few ad hoc. Uh, it does a really nice job. They're responsible for a ton of systems uh, in big cities at this point and in medium-sized cities. Bang the Table is out of Colorado. Um, I don't know why they all pick green for their images. That's a totally random thing. Must signal something nice, I guess. 
Um, but they create uh, customized software solutions for cities to create engagement. And they'll send, the way this works is you would call them, they're gonna send some VP of sales to come meet with you. Uh, they're going to expand your ideas of what kinds of services they could provide because this is a sales call after all. Uh, and then once you've bought as much of their product as possible, they'll implement that for you. And then charge a reasonable fee to customize that implementation over time. That's what most of these sites do. OpenGov is another big and important one. Um, OpenGov was responsible for the fix, whoops, can't go back, was the, responsible for the fix of healthcare.gov at one point. So, you know, uh, big site. Granicus is hugely popular. A lot of cities within Michigan uh, use software tools provided by Granicus to do this type of thing. So basically, there's a software sales market, which is emerging and developing in civic tech, which is a good sign. Right? If there's profit in this, that's a, it's a good thing that this move outside the purview of government operations. I'm actually enough of a capitalist that I like that somebody is going to care enough to make money on this to keep it going. But that also means there are some limitations and things to be concerned about. Right? Um, I actually had a nice conversation with the VP of product for Granicus. Uh, and the way they make money, have any of you ever done software sales? I don't want to malign anybody in the room. Okay, good. Software salespeople are slimy, right? <laughs> like super greasy people. And basically what happens is they make their money by selling you the most product for the least change they have to do. So they're gonna create a product that looks a lot like WordPress, right? But they get to charge you $60,000 for it instead of just installing WordPress. And then they're gonna come to you and you're gonna say, look, that's great, but I need your product to actually do X or Y. And they're like, no problem, we'll make it do Y for an additional $10,000. Right? And that's okay, the cities don't mind that, and I actually don't mind that either. The problem becomes is, I was asking this VP of product at Granicus, look, so how do you guys innovate? How do you come up with new engagement solutions or new products and over time? And he's like, we don't, right? Our entire incentive is to change our template as little as possible from city to city, right? Like we just want to install vanilla version of engagement software in as many cities as possible because of course, uh, innovation requires R and D. It requires investment, and they don't. They don't. Their I think their margins are thin enough. They don't really have a lot of space to do that R and D work to innovate on their product. So that's a little bit of a bummer. You guys look a little down, but there's there are other people doing this that I think are more interesting. Uh oh. Other ways outside of that greasy software market. So some people just use social media, right? There's a ton of people using different types of social media to do their government-based work. Police departments, for instance, have largely been big adopters of Twitter to get the word out. First responders in general love Twitter for its quickness, and there's a ton of academic work on the use of Twitter for emergency situations. Um, uh, Facebook is really popular, partially because the people who get engaged with government uh, tend to also be in the demographic region of heavy Facebook users. What is that demographic region? Hint. Right? Grain, right? Old gray beards and stuff like that. The, the Facebook interactions are very effective for cities because it allows them a nice set of tools. It's free, of course, um, and it speaks to a population that's most engaged with them. There are a ton of nonprofit organizations that are also innovating around this technology. Um, Jennifer Palka uh, has done a bunch of TED Talks in this space, if you want to see somebody uh, also talk about this, but in a much cooler way. Uh, she, was in, she was really invested, she was driving, her, her origin story is she was driving around with her daughter in Boston, and she saw some city uh, hydrants, fire hydrants again, that were uh, in disrepair and needed some help. And she was wondering, why couldn't I just fix them? instead of having to go through government and do this kind of Byzantine process. So she got this idea of like, what could information technology be used for? And from that uh, innovation and insight with her daughter, she started Code for America. What Code for America initially did was they did a lot of work where they would hire technologists, people with some coding skills, people experts in UX design, et cetera, et cetera, to work within a specific city. 
So the uh, Code for America fellow who worked in Detroit, for instance, worked with the transportation system because famously Detroit buses were really struggling to be on time. And if you're going to take the public bus in Detroit, you're really going to struggle with uh, timetables and everything. So Matt, the guy who was the uh, Code for America fellow uh, in Detroit, worked on an application to help you track the buses and see when and where they actually were. Um, people have done different things. One of my favorites was in Honolulu. The Code for America project was a Honolulu Answers, which was kind of like stack overflow for civic data in the city of Honolulu, right? It was a, a crowdsourced question and answer forum that was really effective and nice. So Code for America has been doing a ton of great stuff, um, you know, redesigning government forms. Uh, they're now changed their model a little bit, where now they hire their, their programmers directly um, and do their own user experience work. Even in Detroit, there's this great uh, kind of social startup called uh, Sevilla. Anybody work with them at all or have any experience with Sevilla? Really nice shop that, uh, located in the tech town in Detroit. Um, they do a lot of user experience design work and really deep, rich, um, kind of engaged work with people in a community. And the first project they worked on was um, a new form to help people seek public assistance. So I hope you've never had to seek public assistance, but if you have, you know that the bureaucracy surrounding it is incredible and terrible, right? Like it required uh, the, the paper you can see rolled up here was the amount of paper needed for the old form to seek any of the kind of public assistance that's talked about in the blurb here. What Sevilla did is they went through and abiding by all the policies and laws and doing a lot of just field work where they talked to policymakers and people who were on public assistance, et cetera, et cetera. They were able to create a really nicely designed form that was only five pages long but still got people access to the public assistance that they needed. Now, if you're in crisis and you need public assistance, being faced with a five-page form instead of a 60-page form is heaven, right? Like that is information technology doing good within a community and changing how citizens interact with their government. So Sevilla is now turning their attention to some other kind of big public issues, but if you get a chance to, if you're ever in Tech Town near Wayne State and uh, just want to visit them, they're a really great shop. Uh, there's also data-driven Detroit. Data-driven Detroit takes a lot of um, data that Detroit produces and then turns it into actionable maps. Their clients, actually, the people they serve, are other nonprofits and grant writers who are trying to write data and papers about Detroit. Uh, and data-driven Detroit will provide them with insights to help them fuel their own proposals. So that's, let's pause there. Any questions? Lots of good stuff going on in the field. Yeah. Yeah, with Sevilla, the director for that was telling me that it's, it, for them it was, it was basically schmoozing and just the typical old glad handing. So their director had enough social capital. He'd been a former Michigan director for United Way in Michigan, so he had the connections and everything to get in the right rooms. So it's, it's a very human side to that story where it's kind of still the same uh, old network of people that you have to be able to plug into to make a change like that. That's a big change. Um, and then I'll talk about how we do that for CID. Any other questions? Stephanie, did you have your hand up? No? We're good? Okay. So that leads me to what I'm doing in this space, uh, and that's through a project called Citizen Interaction Design, right? And what we do with that is we are teaming up with specific cities to try to implement civic technology. So what does that look like? First off, I wanted to make, just make sure I took a step back on the term interaction design. Everybody feels pretty comfortable with that term. Um, interaction design is kind of the cross-section between human-computer interaction, industrial design, user experience design. It's a set of practices, basically, very closely related to what we do in information and media studies about how we understand how people use these tools. Uh, and then we just apply that to insights that are actionable. Right? So you know, there's a couple directions. The, the, work, the research that I do to understand how somebody uses an information tool, at, once I've done analyzing that, that could either go in the direction of I write an academic paper, which I often like to do, or it can go in the direction of I design an application and try to fix the problem. Right? And up until that split, the work actually looks fairly similar. Interaction design is just kind of the professionalization of a lot of the research methods that we learned through the process of education here. Make sense? 
All right, uh, so that, and that just means like conducting research in a wide variety of domains, planning and running uh, research with humans, analyzing results in a way that makes sense and is high quality, and then importantly, communicating those results. I think the biggest difference between how we write these up for academia versus how you would put this into practice uh, is you have to be able to tell a story that is incredibly uh, uh, influential which is a little bit different than some of our academic papers, right? Like, you have to write a good academic paper. That's an art within itself. But like what Sevilla does when it was pitching its story to lawmakers is they have, for instance, this walkthrough that you go through where they have giant pictures of the people on public assistance and a little bit of their story that's playing. So it puts a human face to the problem, right? There's a little bit of their walkthrough where you're actually walking through these strings hanging from the ceiling and these strings are brushing across your face and body as you walk through them. And at the end of this little pathway, they say, the number of strings you just walked through is the number of people who applied for public assistance in Michigan this week, right? And that tells a story that's much more visceral than our typical writing for how we describe this stuff, right? Because when we write academically, we're objectifying it a little bit. We're taking it back and, uh, and rightfully so, treating it with a little distance. All right. So my question, uh, first couple years I got to the School of Information was, can we teach user experience design through the lens of a city, right? Can we, most of my students want to go work for Facebook or Google or something like that, uh, but can we teach them that there's awesome opportunities within city governments? And then can we teach these uh, user experience design students to also be better citizens? So I had a sneaky agenda. Like there's a whole bunch of kind of typical like little progressive uh, buddies of mine who would take all the right classes and go work in communities and stuff. But I wanted to see if I could trick the most hardcore like I don't care about uh, community service type of person to do community service just because they're le also learning how to do their professional skill. So citizen interaction design was funded by, at first, the School of Information. We got an initial uh, grant of $1.5 million to, from the School of Information. And then we got uh, money from the uh, U of M provost, another $600,000 from them. And currently, we're funded by the NSF through a cyber training grant and IMLS, which is the Institute for Museum and Library Studies uh, out in Washington. Uh, it's been going on for about five years. We've partnered with five different cities. We've uh, passed through hundreds of students, and we've completed scores of projects. The, the thing we do is we place students within cities to work directly with city governments on how to create these civic technology tools, right? Or how to solve a civic problem through the application of information design. There's a couple challenges to that. The first one, surprisingly for me, was the 15-week university cycle. Right? That is a giant challenge. What can you actually get done in 15 weeks when a student has four other classes, their co-curricular activities, sometimes a job, hopefully a significant other they want to spend time with, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the 15-week cycle became a huge problem for us. Um, the other problem that I started to see was a history of extractive town-gown relationships that uh, people in Michigan had experienced. Like I avoided Ann Arbor for the first four or five years of our project because Ann Arbor uh, is burnt out on the University of Michigan, frankly, right? Like the, half the time we see a professor go into a city and do a project with the city, they disappear like Kaiser Soche as soon as the project is over, right? Like, you know, 15 weeks ends and the students and the professor fade back into the bushes like Homer in the GIF. It's, it's amazing how little sometimes the university thinks about the long term for our civic partners. Um, and then the other problem we had was relationships that create impact. Who are the right people to team up with in a city? Right? Um, most of the professors I had worked with and when I'd done this work previously, you find a, a really nice, pliant nonprofit or some worker in the city who's willing to, to take your phone call and you do whatever you can, right? But the problem is, is that those relationships rarely lead to lasting success. So what kind of relationship do you need to have in place? All right, so what we do, we sign a three-year contract with the city. That's an important thing. Right? The three-year contract, we have found out, is the right amount of time because it assures the city we're not disappearing. 
Uh, last time when we signed with Lansing, we had a nice like little day of it. Mayor Shore came to Ann Arbor. Uh, we, I had one of the associate provosts sign the contract. The dean signed the contract. Uh, Mayor Shore signed the contract. Um, you know, so it was all on tape, basically, and public, and everybody's committing to a relationship for three years. That public commitment, it turns out, is hugely important, right? It provides a reason for the mayor to keep taking the calls, provides a way, uh, kind of a, a, a increased commitment internally to the project. Um, we always do this with the mayor and the city manager, by the way. That's how we know that this will work. Um, the other reason the three-year contract is important, we found out, and this surprised us, we didn't know this going in, is because it creates basically a deadline, right? There's, the city has a lot of priorities, and it would be very easy for them to say, that sounds like a good project, but let's work on that next year in our relationship. It turns out to be incredibly effective to actually end a relationship. Don't tell my wife. Like it's a, it's a, it, it turns out that it, having that deadline creates a little bit of a pressure, and it helped us, I think, to do better work and help the city to prioritize in different ways. Um, so yeah, we formed this relationship with the mayor and the city manager. Um, students go out and they do user experience design work and they do some implementation with support of uh, people we hire to help them, right? So our students are not good graphic designers, unlike many of your students. And so uh, they, we hire graphic design help for them, as an example. Um, how do we form a relationship with the city is a big issue for us. Uh, my project manager and I spend a lot of time meeting with different city mayors and city project managers. And you can tell after a conversation. So usually they seek us out, right? You need some forward-thinking person in the city who's going to be your advocate. And so with Ferndale, for instance, we were meeting at the Michigan Municipal League. And the city manager for Ferndale is like, you guys are going to come to lunch with me, and we're going to make a relationship happen by hook or by crook. Um, I tried to make something happen with the city of Holland, where I grew up, because I love Holland and I wanted to, to be there. Uh, met with their manager or their mayor and their city manager. Clear, it was not going to work out, <laughs> right? And so we just had to walk away from it. Um, uh, Lansing, Verge Bonero actually came to us and said, hey, "You're going to work with Mayor Shore. You're going to have some troubles," you know, like in typical Verge Bonero style. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, those things all just, the, if the city seeks us out, we know they want us there, and the relationship becomes less extractive. All right, so partner cities we've worked with. Uh, we started off in Jackson, Michigan for our first three years. From there, we moved to a relationship with Ferndale, um, Michigan, and then simultaneously, uh, we did some projects in Traverse City, uh, Detroit, Grand Rapids, and now Lansing. That are kind of the cities we've been working with over time. The Traverse City one is a challenge. Part of my other challenge that, that's doing this with students is, of course, I have to get students to these places, right? So how do I, like, for when we were in Jackson, what I did is I rented one of our big buses and would actually bus the students to Jackson uh, to do the work and to work closely with city staff. There were a couple of un unanticipated problems with that, right? Like, my idea was I was going to lecture on the bus during the time, like, between Ann Arbor and Jackson. Uh, turns out, buses are loud. <laughs> They're surprisingly loud. So the lecture didn't happen. The other problem, it turned out, I don't know if you guys have ever been a bus like that on the expressway. They rock a lot. And it turned out about half my students discovered they got motion sick <laughs> during that. I had one uh, person who visited us. She was from the School of Social Work, and she rode with us. She had to have a lie down during the entire rest of the visit because she was so motion sick by the end of the bus ride. So. Unanticipated problems with collaborative and engaged learning. I, should, I could write a little article on that. All right, so what do these things actually look like, right? I've been talking mostly in the abstract, but it might be helped, helpful to give a little concrete demonstration of what some of these projects have actually been like. In Jackson, uh, their favorite one, and the one I liked most, was uh, the distressed property report. So Jackson has a lot of homes that could be torn down and are considered blighted property, right? Um, by the way, it turns out that neighbors do not like homes in their neighborhood being called blight. Uh, that is a very negative turn, and we learned to, to avoid it very quickly. Um, now, the problem became is the process by which a house gets torn down is actually incredibly complex. 
from the time somebody reports it to the police to when a city inspector comes out to when it gets actually condemned to when the city raises money to tear it down can be months to years and you don't know where at any given time a house is in the process. We also had instances where the house was being demolished by the city but the property is actually owned by the county so the county would sell the house at auction and then the city would tear that house down without the new owner knowing it was being torn down. All right, so incredibly hidden, opaque process. Distressed property report made it so that you could type in any address uh, in Jackson into the, the thing, and you could see the status of the house, where it was in the process. You got a super nice little information graphic that showed you what the process looked like as part of the page, and just kind of highlighted what the whole process was for people. Open data Jackson. Uh, Jackson was very interested in having an open data policy. So our first group of students who went out and did that, it turns out that uh, we spent an entire semester going to public meetings in Jackson explaining what open meant, what data meant, and then what open plus data meant, right? So our poor students who worked on it in their first semester, uh, just they went to about 14 public meetings uh, just to explain what this would look like and what the implications were. We passed this off between four groups of students working on it separately. The way we got around the 15-week semester is many of these projects would live from semester to semester and be handed off from one student group to another. So the open data portal became something that four groups of students worked on. That blight status that I just showed, that was not the work of 15 weeks. That's actually a pretty nice site. The blight stratus, uh, the, the stress property report was six groups of students, including two groups of summer interns uh, who worked at City Hall kind of making that all happen. Right? So handing off projects from student group to student group allowed us to do more complex and aggressive things. So eventually our students uh, created an open data portal for Jackson. They actually recommended and implemented a commercial service for this. And Jackson uh, passed a law, a city law, requiring open data for city workers and became the first city in the state of Michigan to do so. Another kind of example of a project our students did in Jackson, this is the uh, Dig Downtown. Jackson was undergoing some major construction in the downtown area, which I'm sure we can all sympathize is a giant pain in the ass to get around when you're driving. So uh, our students went and they interviewed uh, business owners and they interviewed people who came downtown a lot and did a bunch of design work and they came up with these nice maps to show how do you get around construction and what can you do. The other thing they did as information objects that they created were these downtown sites, uh, signs and posters that they designed and created so that, you know, this as an information technology, I always love it as, as an example, because this is definitely an information technology, right? But it's not what we think of, it's not a mobile app, it's not some cool website. It, the, the lesson we tell in citizen ad interaction design is you want to use the least complex technology possible to get the job done, right? The least complex technology possible. One of my other favorite ones, we also worked with the bus system here. They wanted an app like Detroit was using, um, but I made the students ride the bus for the day and talk to people, and they found that only about half the people on the, phone, on the bus actually had a smartphone that would be capable of loading an app like that. So what the students ended up doing was redesigning the bus maps to focus on areas of interest, like how to get to Meyer and how to get to the mall, as opposed to cross streets, which nobody knew the names of the streets. And by refocusing areas of interest on the maps, they got a 20% increase in ridership because people were able to figure out the bus system more frequently. Uh, another big success for us was Access for All. This was with a group of Disability Connect in the city of Jackson. And what this was was, um, you know, most everybody has to apply by uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act in the United States, right? But there's a lot of leeway for how you actually interpret that. So if you're in a scooter or a wheelchair and you go to a restaurant, it turns out there's a whole bunch of things that can become a problem, right? Like, are the aisles actually wide enough for me to get my scooter through? Right? Is the bathroom in such a way that I could actually drive a scooter into it and get my scooter back out? Right? Like the, the, what is actually accessible is a lot more complex than what you would typically find. And of course, Yelp or other review sites don't care at all about accessibility for the most part. Right? They might have a little one to five rating, is this accessible? But that's not very helpful. So our students created Access for All. Um, and that was a site where you could go in and you could rank, you could take, take, take any business in Jackson and it's now expanded to Hillsdale County and Lenaway County as well, and rate it. You could give like, say, give it real, some real talk in terms of like, 
you know, how far away is the parking lot from the actual entrance and what do you have to do to get in and what's the ramp like, how steep is the ramp, you know, all this stuff that's really important for people with accessibility, suddenly you could do this. And this site actually was created in a 15-week semester. This is just a WordPress with some fancy plugins on it and it's still going uh, three years later, which is nice. All right. Uh, in Ferndale, or Traverse City, a, a project we did was around housing inequality. Anybody from Traverse City region? No? Traverse City is lovely. Uh, it's about that time of year when we should all go up to Traverse City and do our color tour, right? Uh, but because of Airbnb and similar dystopian, uh, disaggregated rental markets, uh, anybody with a house in Traverse City is, is renting it on Airbnb, right? They're no longer signing affordable lease contracts with all the people who work up in Grand Traverse region. So it's created a housing crisis around Traverse City and surrounding areas where people can no longer afford to live in the region because so much of the property is being soaked up by Airbnb rentals. So there's a lot of problems with that. We worked with a group of nonprofits and the Traverse, Traverse City uh, Mayor's Office up there to create a home share toolkit. Uh, the idea here is that if you have a person who owns their home but is elderly and might need some support, could they uh, advertise and find a way to actually share their home with somebody who needs housing in exchange for physical support as well as uh, some rent? Right? So you'd get a lower price rent, you'd get a room in the house, and you'd help take out the garbage or do something that you know, the older person's no longer able to do. Uh, they loved it. The Traverse City region has been piloting this for the past two years, and I think they have something like 60 home shares that they've been able to set up in the past couple years. Um, you know, and they're, they're trying to expand that program now. So my personal favorite is a project we did in uh, Ferndale, Michigan, and it has to do with rats. Right? So what do rats have to do with citizenship? There's a horrifying, right? Skill. So Ferndale is a, is a suburb of metro, in Metro Detroit. I like every city, and especially cities around Metro Detroit, they have a big rat problem. And especially there's some construction going on in North Detroit that I think disturbed some sort of mega warren. And all of the metro cities have been actually having problems with the diaspora of rats that came out of that construction project. And that was um, a problem because what was happening is uh, sit, when you saw a rat in the city, what you would do is you'd call the city inspector's office and leave them a voicemail. So the city inspector was coming in to 150 voicemail messages in the morning that, because that's his job, he'd have to listen to them in sequence and write down the details. And it was taking up like four hours of his day every day just listening to rat sightings. But, and he couldn't actually get back to people, so what would then happen is citizens got super frustrated about that. So they formed these Facebook-based vigilante groups where they were out like with their 22s, hunting rats in the streets kind of thing, right? And the, the Ferndale did also did not want citizens running around with long rifles shooting rats in neighborhoods where kids play and stuff like that. So it, was, it became a big problem for them and a surprisingly civic problem. Uh, so our students went door to door throughout Ferndale and did interviews with people, especially some of the activists in these rat communities and did a lot of, uh, uh, legwork to see what would work for people, what kind of system would work. And what they came up with was a mobile app using just Twilio, so it's not hard to maintain, it's uh, auto-maintained in the background. And what it does is you can text a rat sighting in your yard and it will send automatically a message to the city inspector uh, and you get a little something back, right? So uh, you text it out and uh, eventually what you'll get is a little message saying, did you know that fruit trees in your yard can attract rats? and stuff like that. So it's, you got something back. You knew it was a bot, but it was still better than just leaving a voicemail message and nothing ever happening, right? Um, the students also then uh, went so far as to print out 7,000 refrigerator magnets and have them sent with the water bill to every home in the city of Ferndale. So uh, the Ferndale Water Department sent the, with the water bill all these fridge magnets so you knew what the rat chat line was because you got the nice Magnet, right? And then what the city inspector got was a super nice dashboard that had kind of a frequency of calls when the calls would come in, and eventually the students created a heat map so you could see where the uh, preponderance of reportings were occurring. 
They presented this work to uh, this, uh, Ferndale, and then uh, it just got huge. They really enjoyed it. Uh, Ferndale adopted this and really had a good time with it. Actually, the city of Atlanta uh, came to Ferndale after a while and adopted a version of this for themselves uh, to report sat rat sightings, and it uh, was our surprise success, given that nobody wanted to work on this project in the first place. <laughs> So some current projects that we're working on. With Ferndale, we're helping to streamline uh, the, budget, the department budgeting process. This sounds boring as heck to me personally. The students actually love it. Um, it how you set priorities and how you set funding priorities in a city like Ferndale, which has about a $25 million budget, which is about the size of budget we typically see in a city of that size. You know, it's a lot. How much do you spend on police? How much do we spend on new uh, efforts? How much am I going to spend on uh, picking up leaves versus picking up garbage? So we helped them create a system to crowdsource more amongst the city priorities for spending and to create better feedback loops for how departments should actually prioritize their needs for spending. In Detroit, we've been working with the Department of Innovation and Emerging Technology. Um, w one of our People who worked on this early was a guy named Garland Gilchrist. He connected us up with Detroit. Garland just became lieutenant governor for the state of Michigan a little bit ago, so uh, I, he hasn't been answering my calls since then to do work. <laughs> he's probably, I think he's busy. Um, but you know, hooking us up with this idea of how can this uh, really awesome department within Detroit get their open data that they have tons of access to out to the various agencies who need it. Right? It turns out that data flow and how you take something from being open to being usable is a surprisingly hard problem. And so our students are working on ways to help make that data more accessible. Yeah. Um, in Lansing, which is a newer relationship for us, the, we're doing a bunch of things. One of the big ones that the city cares about, and Mayor Shore especially is, is asking for updates on every couple weeks, is making the process of contacting the city more efficient for citizens. Right, so if you ever had to call Lansing for something, it's actually a bit of a uh, problem. We did a participatory design with uh, citizens of Lansing, and this bottom diagram is actually one they drew, right? Where uh, they draw like what they imagine the communication process with the city is like, and the big spaghetti in the middle is what happens to a call, right? And we were able to formalize that a little bit more uh, in an internship with the city of Lansing over the summer, which is basically, you, people have no idea who's actually in charge of a problem within a city, right? And so you call the best number that you can and just hope that you got the right one. And the person in city hall is trying to do their best, but if they don't know how to actually fix the problem, hopefully they know who actually can and can transfer your call. But it's, it's friction. It's wasting everybody's time. It's creating frustration on the parts of the citizens. It's, it's distracting and delaying time from the people in the city. And so can we create smoother call operations within the city and help them to smooth out that process in an effective way. In Ann Arbor, we're uh, working to improve voter turnout. So um, the idea that Ann Arbor has is that people don't vote because there's long lines. I'm not sure about that personally, but with this new application, uh, what you can do is take voter, uh, the, you know how there's volunteer workers, poll workers at every voter uh, station, they always are updating on a half hour basis how many people are in line. So we feed that into an application so you can get relatively real time data about how many people are in line at these poll stations at any given time. Right? The other thing it will do is Michigan just changed the rules so you can register same day as you vote. You just have to go to the city clerk to do it. So it will provide you with an auto map of how to get to the city clerk's office if you really want to vote right at that point. And the final design is just, it's trying to be simple, right? It's what precinct you're in and what your, or what like your street address is so you know what precinct you should go to. And then you just search and it'll just show you a really nice little uh, uh, ticker of how many people are in the line at that particular point. And as they collect longitudinal data over time, they're hoping to show kind of trend data, right? So like around uh, 9 a.m. you can expect long lines versus historically 3 p.m. is short lines or whatever it happens to be. All right, what would we learn from this process? Uh, individual nice projects like that are all great, but our biggest effect seems to be on city staff. When we talk to city managers and the mayors, what they say our effect is is that we help staff to become much more oriented towards design thinking and to be thinking of civic problems as information problems. 
Now, almost everybody here trained as an engineer, like a, a, a mechanical engineer, industrial engineer, civic engineer, or as an urban planner, or sometimes as a lawyer or poly, uh, poli sci person, right? Almost none of them have had training in design thinking or in information data types of sciences. So helping them to reorient their projects around that uh, really changes perspectives for a lot of people. And you can see, like, my favorite guy I worked with was this dude, like, 6'9", tatted up, great guy named Juan, who was the d d director of the Department of Public Works for Ferndale. Came into the project, like, pretty open with us, like, uh, you guys suck. I don't want to do the bullshit you guys want me to do. Uh, I just clean streets, and that's what I do, and my guys don't want to be involved in your mess, right? Which I appreciate that kind of forthrightness. But by the end of two years later, he was like, hey, I think we have this problem that's uh, applicable for you guys. And this seems like a design, this is an information problem for me about snow removal. Can we get somebody to take a look at it, right? That, that kind of perspective change is a big effect for us. Um, students struggle to find the least technology needed. They really want to build apps uh, for their portfolios. They want to have some sweet looking, you know, adaptive HTML5 type of, you know, whoozy what's it's. This is a, a board we made in a park in Jackson, in Loomis Park, that is an information technology object, right? It turned out for the neighborhood watch, the best thing to have was a cork board in the neighborhood park. Um, students struggle with that lesson sometimes. Having dedicated staff uh, who do the specific work of bridging the town gown relationship helped us to get over some of that. If it were totally up to me, this whole thing would fail pretty much immediately. It's the staff that we have assigned to it that make it work. All right, so next steps. Uh, we have a new grant from Cyber Training um, to help take these lessons and to create educational materials to help other cities outside of Michigan start to think about civic problems as information and data problems. Um, and then we're also doing something, like I said, through IMLS to train public librarians to be the ones who facilitate this kind of uh, participatory design work within their communities. So it's going to be retraining for already working public librarians in the space. All right, so yeah, I'll take five minutes on this too. So what does this mean for HCI? HCI is human computer interaction for those of you who are kind of up on the lingo and it's uh, typified by CHI 2020 which was going to take place in, Hawaii, in Honolulu, Hawaii in May if you guys, you know, still two weeks left for deadlines to get into that if you're interested. What's that? April. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah, right. I guess I should know that since I'm running the thing or running the <laughs> field. All right. So this gets into an issue called HCI plus X, right? Uh, and I love this paper, The Turn to Practice in HCI Towards a Research Agenda by Kuti and Bannon from 2014. And there, HCI started in this space where it was very much about interaction between a human and a device, right? We're the people who came up with touch screens. We're the people who came up with gestures. We're, we love that kind of thing. We, we like the mouse and, you know, Douglas Engelbart is our uh, spiritual godfather in HCI for inventing a whole bunch of the things that we care about. But that's all about individual cognitive interactions with a computing device. Increasingly, what we become interested in is the role these computing devices play as intercessionaries between us and what we're trying to accomplish. For you guys, that's communication in a lot of cases, right? Sometimes it's different things, and it's about uh, the, the frames that we use to enact our lives and the work that we do. So interaction versus practice is the change that HCI is going through. HCI is a mess. Like when I first came to work for MSU, um, uh, I remember the chair at the time was fairly dismissive of HCI, and I think he was right to be so, because it is. It's a hodgepodge of theories. It's, uh, there is no HCI theory per se, right? Which has always been limiting to it. There's theories that HCI uses. Um, interaction design and this focus on building can also be a problem in some ways. But what ties us all together is this idea that we can move towards a practice lens and that helps us to frame the kinds of advances I think HCI is gonna make in the next 20 years. If this was just, again, about pointing devices and how big the buttons should be on your phone to maximize how often you use your phone, I think industry has got that right now. I think the essential turn for HCI is understanding the way that mediation is affecting real-world problems, real-world practices, and the work we're trying to accomplish on any given day. Um, so citizenship is one of those types of work. Right? It's one of the contexts by which we think practice within HCI 
can be changed as we think about what mediation does to processes that have largely been either unmediated or mediated by older technologies in the past. Right? So I think we can make uh, citizenship better by using these tools, and we can help citizens be more flexible, more adaptive, serve a wider swath of its students, uh, or citizens, but we'll see. Uh, and I've got pictures of Kelly, who's our engagement learning, engaged learning specialist at the college, and Scott Tenbrink, who's our program manager, who actually goes out and hustles in all the cities and keeps everybody happy. Uh, they're the ones who actually make this work. So with that, like, let's have a conversation. Thanks. presented had to do with apps or technology um, that, that could facilitate, you know, informing people about whether it was health misinformation or news misinformation. Yeah. And one of the things that came out of that by potential funders was that how do you maintain something like that over the long run? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question the funders are asking because uh, my average period by which an app will break is six months. Right, like something will change in one of the hosting platforms, or something will change in the phone operating system, uh, such that apps need constant, at least semi-annual maintenance. So, uh, yeah, if there's no money for ma maintenance of the app, then it's just not going to be successful over a longer period. So this works because it's connected to governments. Yeah, when so one of the things uh, when our students are working with a uh, a project like this, one of the things they write is what I call the sustainability report where they have to write up how is this going to be maintained, right? Like who's in charge of maintaining it so it doesn't fall through the cracks. Like specifically, hey, you uh, deputy chief of police, this is your responsibility now to you own this. And it has to be a budget if a budget is required. And it has to be success metrics, right? So in nine months, how will you know if this is successful or not? Right, and if it, if you have these metrics, keep going or reinvest. If you have these metrics, shut it off and pretend it never happened. Right, like you know, uh, those are the options I give people. Yeah. On that note, um, you had I think presented a lot of data on the front end of kind of that you're collecting from both the citizen side and the organization government side um, to figure out what the problem is. Right, how to strategize and, and address the problem, and then I think you should you showed us some data on kind of. I think more from the government agency side of like, yeah. how is it working or not? And I yeah, was just curious, are you collecting any data from citizens to get the sense of like, do they feel more connected yeah. to their governments? I'm not and I should. Okay. I did once with Jackson, I did a pre-post. Uh, yeah. When we started Jackson, I mailed out uh, surveys, Bob LaRose style. If you've never met Bob, like, and his his exact, I mean, I, in, in my head, he's in there with the crisp $2 bill in the mailed survey to the house. Um, so we did a pre-post then, and we didn't find much change in terms of how citizens felt about it uh, at a broad population level, because that was a nicely done kind of uh, representative sample of the, the cities of, citizens of Jackson. We did find with our already more engaged citizens or people who became engaged through the process that they had a fairly large effect. But that's something I should do more of. I should definitely do more of kind of the citizen measurement. Susan. And I think the example of shares SB, the evaluation is this really central and tricky part of the design process. Yeah. And how do you evaluate, I mean, you're not just doing usability, and, or, or are you? How are you evaluating these interventions? Yeah, one of the things we do is we, one of them is survival analysis, basically. Okay. Like we look, is it still being used six months down the road, uh, uh, a year down the road? So that's what my program manager does, is he checks in on all these projects over time and sees what works and what doesn't. I, I kind of skipped over one called Ferndale Walks, where they created a similar Twilio application uh, to help people l learn about different physical activities taking place in town. That one did not work, right? And so. One of the things that we do, the service that Scott and I provide, is we go through the, the back to the city manager and we say, this isn't working, either let's try something different or just stop investment in this. But we don't do that rigorously enough. That's something else we, I think we could work up. I think I have two questions. One of them I think is an evaluation question. On the blighted properties in Jackson, um, your application, were you able to find that there were fewer blighted properties in Jackson? My second question is, if you're not calling them blighted properties, what are you calling them? We call them distressed properties. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
No, there weren't any fewer because that there's just such larger socioeconomical factors that go into whether a house is distressed or not. The surprising effect of the the distressed property report was its biggest use case were for developers who were tracking big parcels of property to purchase for redevelopment, right? So that's a little greasy, and the city, but the city was aware of it and they got ahead of it. But that was for me a surprise, and that's that's one of the interesting issues I think about this kind of work. I don't know anything about property development, right? Like we have to become at least mildly conversant in so many different areas of civic interaction that it's like I now know more about leaf pickup than any person who's not a public works official should know, right? But that's it's fun to to get that experience. As Johannes is standing up, so this is probably the last one. <laughs> These are interesting projects. I love them. I'm sorry. Please don't speak up. Yeah. Uh, scalability is, is thinking about uh, you, you know, the, the rat problem. I, I know plenty of other cities that yeah. have rat problems as well. Have you thought much about, okay, we've developed this project, you know, it's a small project, whether it's a few years or not, but about moving those projects to other places as well. Like, hey, we have a product sort of like this, or I'm not sure if the product is the right word. But. Yeah. We, so we put everything up on GitHub. Okay. Um, oh, so, so. But nothing is used off GitHub, and it's because city staff don't know how to use GitHub, right? Like so, so we actually are seeking money right now for a portal or a something like GitHub that would be targeted more specifically to the um, uh, public sector. And I just had meetings in, uh, at the Hill this week to talk to uh, Senator Peters and Senator, uh, Senator Stavenow's folks, and they're very interested in helping us do this and in basically trying to get some of these applications more widely used, not just in Michigan, but nationally. We do, and that's, that's actually the most uncomfortable part for my students, right? Like, they, they love the design parts and building, but they also have to learn a little bit of advertising and marketing, because that's the thing. You can build something, and unless you do the messaging around it, nobody's going to use it, right? So that's why with Rat Chat, the effective thing wasn't just the tool, it was the refrigerator magnets, right? Like, it was getting some media coverage. It was working effectively where people could see the messaging to be able to know that such a thing existed. Because if you build something great and nobody uses it, it's still a bad design, right? Like that's just part of the process. So one question I have, you know, we know we can get people a lot of times to use these things and we see, you know, stuff we, we can see the activity on the, on the sites and the apps, but, uh, you know, for whom are they actually useful? So yeah. the, the, what we always seem to come back for, not work with lots of the slimy folks that you were discussing earlier. Yeah. And one of the things I can't get them to do is think about, how to design in a way that's used for pe for people who are not proficient in app use that's or right. not proficient in internet yeah. use who the private market don't is have that designing for people who procure yeah pay the bill. so it, it really helps the and, and we we did a lot of early work with that kind of with the uh, civic engagement and internet use it was like they these sites are really helpful for people who are already engaged right. but are they helpful for people who weren't yeah, I think next stage stuff is stuff like Waze, right? Yeah, right. Right, where you are being engaged almost incidentally. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. <laughs> and there, I think that's the next generation of civic tech type of things, are applications that are so useful they become invisible, right? right? The goal of usability is always, in some ways, invisibility. Like, it should become so useful and usable that it's not even that you're participating in civic process, you're, it's just your normal interactions are causing civic data and civic engagement to happen. That's what I'd love to see, to be honest. So this is all fascinating and really interesting. Um, and I, I want to sort of- uh, at the end of that. <laughs> 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 and so this is, uh, I want to ask a couple of uh, questions on, on the broader implication. Right? Because it seems that many of the projects you do um, you know, they sort of are, at some level, they are instrumental, like taking care of rats, prioritizing budgets, yeah. creating open data interfaces. But they all, almost inevitably, or at least most of them, probably also raise bigger issues. And I'm wondering how deep your students get into those. Let me give you two examples, right? So the open data question. One, one big challenge is, uh, you know, you make data open available, but then what happens next, right? Do, is right. there any, do you think about the, the uh, intellectual property rights agreements that govern what happens in the next phase? Is, so, or is somebody able to come in and privatize the data? You, you, you 
you make them public in one stage, but in the next yeah. stage, commercial vendors come in and, and reprivatize them and, That's right. and, and undermine to some degree maybe the, the purpose of the project. Or or the you know the Frontdale example, you said it's it's it doesn't engage you, but I think there's a really interesting theoretical question more often than this can we aggregate from, from the crowd to meaningful collective choices, right? I mean, yeah. there's the famous arrow paradox from 1962 That's right. that says you can't actually, yeah. because preferences are uh, inconsistent. So, so before you know it, you get into really hard and heavy theoretical and conceptual issues. And the question is, do your projects, do you veer that far, or do you focus more on the, on the design process and solving a problem? Yeah, I would say definitely our focus is on the design problem. Sometimes, and the open data one's a good example, uh, we get pushed into the more, I think, the deeper questions about you know, ethics and use and policy. So the, the open data one, for example, the policy implications became clear almost right away. In fact, one of the two students who worked on the first round of this ended up going to law school after he got his <laughs> degree and is now an information policy guy. Um, it, so, Sometimes, and I think part of the limitation we have here is uh, the city is usually our leader, right? Like we adopt these problems from the city, and I think the, when we don't think about it often it's because the city also is sometimes purposely, sometimes not purposely, also not thinking about some of those deeper issues. Aggregation is a great example, and I should think about that some more because you're right, like what we find is that if you aggregate, the, the city's got an incentive to work on the majority. But you don't really have a majority. What you have is a tapestry of individual pockets of interests around a city. And in fact, going by a majority can sometimes be very misleading as to what you should actually do. But how do you make that tapestry more apparent? I think that's another great direction for the future. I'm stopping us from food at this point. You May I just sort of make one, one remark? I'm sure you are aware of this, but there's the whole, I mean, uh, earlier, la last year, I think they started it, but the Hewlett Foundation, Ford Foundation, New America Foundation, yeah. uh, and, and, the, and a couple of others started this bigger project on public interest technology. And I think, you know, the, I think your university is actually a founding member of, of the university yeah. consortium. So, the, so maybe there's a, a way to scale, you know, using that as a leverage. Yeah, it's interesting, we, also, we often, we almost always get public policy students who take the class <coughs> stuff. Very often business school students who want to do something besides evil. And, uh, um, you know, uh, students from a lot of the more kind of policy oriented places. And it, it's interesting to see how they interact with these projects, but yeah. All right, Pasha, get us out of here and get some food? Yeah, I think that, it, that uh, the food's supposed to arrive at noon, it should be there, so we can continue this conversation down the hall in room 191. So thanks, Cliff. Yeah, thank you.